auspicious greetings. Please allow me to begin by acknowledging the Darawal people as the traditional owners of the land on which Nantian Institute resides. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all are. And I pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and celebrate the diversity of indigenous peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters on which we now have the privilege to enjoy. In 2014, Laurie Zoloff, the then president of the American Academy of Religion, issued an urgent appeal to the 10,000 religious scholars in her membership to one, pay attention to the warnings of IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, two, to let the findings of the sciences interrupt our lives, and finally, devote serious attention to researching the solutions to the problems of climate change. Let us pause for a moment to reflect on her call. We make moral choices. We also teach and counsel. We meet people and demonstrate to them our moral agency through the words we choose to use and the behavior we choose to enact. People, be it our children, students, devotees, or patients, look to us for solutions and guidance. Yes, we have power and responsibility. The moral question we face is not only the greatest, but also the most urgent. There was and is no time to lose. Almost 10 years later, her cry for scholars to do something still haunts my heart, especially now that the interruption is forced upon us globally and suddenly. About 1950, there was a marked change of the Earth's atmospheric carbon dioxide and surface temperature, largely due to a rapid rise of human activities leading to the onset of the Anthropocene, the end of more than a 100,000-year record of stable living conditions that nourished human civilization as we know today. The unfolding of events since then has been extremely complex, made all the more difficult by the intricate interconnectedness that characterizes our existence. The global interruption called COVID-19 brought with it a silver lining. In a stunning documentary, The Year Earth Changed, David Attenborough showed how the healing process took place in the oceans, atmosphere, and on land. Attenborough's recent production, together with Johan Rockström, on Breaking Boundaries, the Science of Our Planet, offers hope on how we can restore the boundaries threatening our ecosystem. They are rather simple. One, plant trees. Two, adopt a plant-based diet. Three, reduce waste and four, use renewable sources of energy. They sound like four easy steps, but yet something is stopping us to save ourselves from the sixth mass extinction. What could that be? For that, I turn away from an exploration of the external environment to something else. This something else is in the internal environment of our minds. Let me quote Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, who writes in The Symbolic Life, and I quote, Indeed, it is becoming ever more obvious that it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself, who is man's greatest danger to man, for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic epidemics, which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural catastrophes. Unquote. What are these psychic epidemics that Jung referred to? Psychic epidemics happen when masses of people are caught up in unwholesome mental states, 
such as delusion, fear, hatred, or anxiety. Add to that fake news that go viral, we end up with the perfect catalyst for wrong actions. In how fear works, 21st century sociologist Frank Faraday writes that the Western 21st century version of personhood is its vulnerability. Add to that the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that characterizes the society of today. It is no wonder that Faraday asserts that being fearful is the normal state. There is certainly value in vulnerability, but fear is counterproductive. Throughout history, we see that flourishing societies show immense capacity to innovate and take risks in the face of an uncertain future, and display courage in the presence of danger. Complicating the tendency towards vulnerability and fear. Digital media is used at a rate never seen before. A global team of researchers from Australia and the UK published the online brain: how the internet may be changing our cognition in 2019. Evidence in this study reveals that the internet can produce both acute and sustained alterations in one our attentional capacities. At the expense of sustained concentration, two, our memory processes shifting the way we retrieve, store, and even value knowledge, and three, our social cognition and social processes, creating a new interplay between the internet and our social lives, including our self-esteem. Not only are many people globally addicted to digital media use. Especially with stay-at-home orders, but the impact is also both psychological and physiological. The structure of our brain is slowly but surely undergoing change. What I've tried to highlight is that the challenges facing humanity now occur both in the external and internal environments, and one is feeding the other. In Buddhist terminology, I see this as systemic collective karma. With such complexities, there cannot be a simple solution. However, I can attempt to make sense of the situation using a Buddhist lens and highlight the challenges ahead for the self. Contact, feeling, ideation, and volition arise from the coming together of three factors, which are. The presence of a sensory object, a functioning sense organ, and consciousness. Together, these three factors make up the sensorium. Taking a closer look at consciousness, the Abhidharma commentarial literature divides consciousness into six types, which are the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The Yogacara or Vijnanavada school further adds two more consciousnesses: ego. And storehouse. While the storehouse appears to be constant and permanent, it is not. Instead, it is a series of continuous consciousness imprints. Ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus is thought to have said, and I quote: "You cannot step into the same river twice, for other waters are continually flowing on." Unquote. While most people take Heraclitus to mean that all things are changing and so we cannot encounter the same phenomenon twice, Markovitch in 1967 argues for something more profound and subtle. It is that some things stay the same only by changing. Heraclitus believes in flux, not to destroy constancy, but rather, paradoxically. As a necessary condition of constancy, the storehouse consciousness can be understood in precisely the same way, as living and present due to its state of flux. The ego consciousness misconceives the storehouse consciousness as the self, and together they give an illusion of the subjectivity of our experience. 
as sentient beings, we are constituted by how we respond to and interpret what we discern through our sensory. That is how connection determines what we become. According to the Yoga Chara school, the external world is a manifestation of our internal consciousness. According to Dan Lustis, cognition shapes our actions, emotions, concerns, and orientations. As we loop through the seeds stored in the storehouse consciousness, we grasp ideas of physical objects that already have an imprint in our storehouse consciousness, thereby reinforcing what we already know. Gradually, we become what we buy, what social media notifications we pay attention to, what fake news we read, and what fears we feed. We forge our sense and meaning of the world in our own image and then devote our lives to pursuing and clinging to it. Hence, it is our behavior or individual karma that brings about the arising of the world through patterns of cyclic causality. William Waldron astutely summarizes with the observation that any afflictive dispositions, such as craving and aggression, are gradually reinforced by the very actions they instigate. The sense of lack remains a constant, but our collective reaction to it has become the need for unhealthy growth, the good life of consumerism, and the gospel of sustained economic growth. According to David Loy, the fundamental defect of any economic system that requires continual growth to survive is that it is not based on needs, but on fear. A fear that feeds on and feeds our sense of lack. Here we are, back to Faraday's fear, working on our weakest link. In a talk at the Buddhist Library in July this year, I pointed to a statement that I've been contemplating for several months now. That thought is not thought because that thought is essentially clear of characteristics. It is a statement that arises from the perfection of wisdom literature. So let me unpack this a little. As human beings, we are constituted of thoughts among our experiences. During meditation, we become more aware of these thoughts, their arising and cessation. Some of these thoughts are accompanied by positive or negative feelings, which then lead us to generate more thoughts, what we often call a train of thoughts. How can we be free of thoughts? According to this statement in the Perfection of Wisdom text, it is not to be attached to any characteristics of thoughts that arise or cease. In other words, non-thought flows freely and does not abide in anything. What does that mean in real life? By pointing back to the nature of all things being essentially clear of characteristics, can that help us to be less desirous and more contented? Let me illustrate with one example. If I look at my mobile phone and I see what you see on the screen now, where do you think my eyes will focus? On that red circle? If I notice the rising of an urge to check that latest social media notification on my phone, can I pause and observe the next thought or the motivation? Is my ego consciousness hungry to be noticed or liked? If I can allow myself to fall into emptiness, creative possibilities may arise. By not feeding my ego over the next few minutes, I may instead be flowing back to the present moment. Let me share a quote from the Dhammapada. Hunger is the greatest illness. Contentment is the greatest wealth. By hunger, I do not think the Buddha or author was referring to physical hunger, but rather our insatiable desires. A contented orientation toward life does not require a flat renunciation of all material possessions. Rather, it specifies an attitude to be cultivated and expressed whether one is rich or poor. To be content with what one has, regardless of its material value, is an expression of wisdom the wisdom of the emptiness of any substantive characteristics associated with the object. Instead, contentment is the natural accompaniment 
of this attitude of non-attachment. I'm indebted to my teacher, Venerable Master Xingyun, for his communistic Buddhist social ethic. He infuses generosity, kindness, compassion, wisdom, sharing, cooperation, and many other humanistic values in what he says, writes, and does. The social ethic is still taking shape. Venerable Master Xingyun set up two organizations, Fo Guang Shan for Monastics and Buddhist Light International Association for Lay Followers. These two communities advance their objectives through the practice of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. By appreciating any given blessings and advancing friendship towards everyone, they believe that they will realize the fullness of our inherent Buddha nature. With meditative concentration, contemplation of the Buddha's name, and upholding the precepts, they hope to experience the wisdom of the Buddha. Their vows will eventually be fulfilled with the foundation of humility and gratitude toward all things. Thousands in these communities commit themselves to cultural, educational, charitable, and religious activities in the hope of benefiting society by bringing relief to those who are suffering under exploitative systems. Under the guidance of the Venerable Master's vision of everyone being global citizens in coexistence, BLIA members have donated respirators and PPE equipment to places in need, planted trees, and encouraged vegetarianism worldwide. There is no dearth of activities to keep the public engaged and connected during trying times. Deserving special mention is the Veggie Map campaign that started recently from Taiwan. People with some spare means pledged vegetarian meals with restaurants that are struggling to keep their businesses afloat. These meals are then sent to the homes of people who are in need of food. The donors benefited mentally from the performance of an altruistic act. The restaurants and delivery people benefited from having work to do, and those in dire need received sustenance. Everyone is equal in this process, and everyone gets his or her needs satisfied. This is the power of communities in holistic health. Here in Nantian Institute, we initiated a detox series soon after lockdown was announced in early 2020. When the global situation did not ease six months later, the communities of practice launched weekly 30-minute Sunday check-in sessions. This enabled people from around the world to connect, develop the habit of a pause, check in with one another, and build a culture of care. Gradually, global friendships developed over Zoom, resulting in an ethical and compassionate posture that will serve to halt delusive thoughts, speech, and behavior one person at a time, one community at a time. I started my presentation with Laurie Zoloth's call for us to voluntarily interrupt our lives by listening to the evidence. The external signals are clear. Climate change, environmental degradation, COVID-19 pandemic, and threat of the sixth mass extinction that will be caused by human activities. The solutions are not difficult either. Yet we are steeped in a psychic epidemic that prevents right action. Rooted in fear, our minds and brains are undergoing a massive challenge in the face of inevitable digital media use. Through the Buddhist lens, I tried to explain what Sutra of the Sutra is cautioning its readers about. Sentient beings are fooled by the sensorium. The perceived constancy of self is actually in a state of flux. Our actions are often motivated by fear and our greatest confusion that there is an eternal self reinforces the endless appropriation of anything that substantiates our becoming. Instead of operating from a happy position of sufficiency, many people are trapped in a dreadful state of lack. There is a Chinese proverb that says, he who ties the bell has to untie it himself, meaning whoever creates a difficult situation must resolve it himself or herself. The perfection of wisdom literature reminds its readers not to cling onto any characteristics and that the nature of all matter is emptiness. 
not only can one become less desirous and less attached, but we can also cultivate positive qualities such as immeasurable loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Coming together in communities with like-minded individuals is now becoming easier with technology. So let's harness the power of communities to turn the tide. Recently, I requested a group of about 50 Buddhist psychologists and counselors to co-create a future that they wish to see after listening to a lengthier version of the talk I just presented. The result was very heartwarming. We wish to leave to future generations a more human society, characterized by social and ecological responsibility, love, and generosity. It will be an awakened society that values being the change that we want to see. For that, it takes the entire human community to support one another out of care and compassion. Thank you, everyone, for co-creating this hopeful future together. <laughs>